So uh, Ian Solomonides from VU is not able to attend today. So Nick Hunt has agreed to step in at extremely short notice. So thank you, Nick. Uh, he's still from William Anglis Institute, right. as he was this morning. <laughs> uh, sitting next to him is Chris Gravina, who is a student at the Bock, well, just completing, I think, at the Box Hill Institute, uh, studying a diploma of sports development. Uh, Richard Speed is Pro Vice Chancellor uh, Regional at La Trobe University. And Kathleen Newcomb is CEO of the Serena Russo Education Group. Now, this session called Joined Up Sector, uh, interpreting that mainly as joining up of vocational and higher education, though we might stray to other forms of connection. Now, we actually already have a reasonably joined up sector at the institution level. About half of higher education providers are also offering vocational education. Uh, only 2% of RTOs are also in higher education, so they aren't massively into it, but the higher education sector itself uh, is. Uh, this year, 9% of applicants for higher education uh, already had a vocational qualification. You're going to hear this 9% a few times. Uh, in the ABS Qualifications and Work Survey in 2015, about 9% of bachelor degree holders also hold, hold a diploma or a certificate three or four, which might have been acquired before or after their bachelor. And similarly, again, about 9% of vocational education commencing students already have a bachelor degree or above. So 9% is very, very common. These numbers are done on a slightly different basis in each data set, but my reading is it's quite possible that there are uh, more higher education graduates in the vocational sector than there are vocational graduates in the higher education sector. So it's not really, in practice, the kind of pathway that we are going to talk about and, and normally discuss it as. Uh, we've heard several times in the conference already that there are obviously very, very different uh, funding and regulatory systems, and we'll try and explore a bit how they, uh, they affect the sort of joined up sector. Kathleen, can I start with you on this sort of idea of pathways from vocational education to higher education? I'm interested in both the positives for the students and also some of the potential negatives for the, the vocational qualification if it's being uh, reinterpreted as a pathway rather than as an independent valuable qualification in its own right. Andrew, I think you characterised the challenges in your introduction in the sense it's not lineal. Increasingly, we're finding it's about just-in-time education, the right education at the right time with a focus on employment outcomes and uh, looking at the, the consumer requirements and the employer's requirements. So there are some real challenges in terms of the um, currency, and I don't mean in terms of the, the, uh, the, in the moment, but the currency in terms of capacity for vocational qualifications to be recognised and valued sometimes, you know, the true value applied to them uh, when our pathway students go into higher education. Um, Peter Noonan's comments this morning about the Australian Qualifications Framework Review are critical to this in the sense that the importance of, of true value being attributed to those qualifications is a pathway. But I think the, the point equally sits the other way in that the way the frameworks operate, when we have students, um, in our organisation we run a Master's of Professional Accounting. We have students in that course who actually need to do basic bookkeeping in a vocational program. Uh, because really, to get their first job, sometimes it is a very entry-level job, and that's what they need to do. So the capacity for a vocational provider to in indeed recognise and give any um, in any uh, RPL or, or any sort of credit out of the Masters of Professional Accounting when the tight training package requirements are so rigid is equally a barrier. So there's barriers both ways uh, which we are constantly dealing with. And so taking ourselves out, you know, we're sitting here as providers thinking about linear movement backwards and forwards. But if you're the consumer or the employer sitting outside that, that that's not of interest to them. They don't want to understand what those barriers are. They want to understand how they get the right skills at the right time and get the benefit of recognition for what they have achieved. 
in its entirety. So is this a common issue where the qualifications don't neatly match the occupations? The whole panel. Is, so it sounds like in accounting, you, know, you need mm. very basic bookkeeping as well as the higher level skills. And is this true in other fields? Or if you're doing tourism and hospitality management, you need to do your RSA, Responsible Service of Alcohol. And at the moment, under the current CRICOS uh, rules, you're not allowed to. So there are barriers that we put in place um, through regulatory frameworks which actually inhibit international students, for example, being able to do their work integrated learning and internship. And, uh, and it's an unintended consequence, I suggest, but it's a thing we need to fix because it is a inhibitor. After you. No. I was just going to say, Andrew, it's, it's, it's all about what the selection and what the student's in, interested in doing. And we talk about pathways, but we really should be talking about really deeply entrenched tram tracks rather than a more sort of broader broader plane because the students will just say, look, I want, I want some of that and I want some of that mm. and where I'm going to get a work, I've been told I need to do that. So often that doesn't reflect the educational mix that the educational providers are putting in front of them. So. Um, it is important that uh, I think we're very conscious of what's happening in change. You're talking about compliance, talking about getting a start. Every student's come with different skills and experience and so therefore the value add as education providers that we can provide to them will differ and often that's not necessarily structured in the same way that the AQF and the, mm -hmm. and the certification and programs are, are, are designed. Yeah, look, um, I think the point about uh, university students benefiting from uh, VET qualifications is a very strong one and it is very difficult. I mean once you've got the the kind of single shot rule that we have around funding VET, um, you know you find that some of the students are able to get funded to do um, let's say uh, a, a package in blood collection say as part of their nursing course. Some of our students will be funded, some of them won't. Um, but the benefit of the VET qualifications, once you recognise that you're dealing with a cohort of students uh, at university who have to go out and, and earn, um, those students you know, don't get employability benefits from university subjects, they, but they can get them directly from TAFE qualifications and VET qualifications. So, you know, I mean, this whole idea of micro-credentials okay, is actually already out there, okay, if we think of pulling VET training packages into degrees to give people um, the ability to go out and earn more. And is that a state government policy issue around the funding of the, the vocational qualification? We do a lot of work uh, in partnership with TOSIN. Um, Andrew Harvey mentioned um, in the last session uh, about this. Um, Franz Beckenbauer, the, the, the famous uh, German football manager, once commented on a German defeat by saying that you could put the entire team in a bag and hit the, hit the bag and it didn't matter who got hurt. That's kind of my feeling about funding arrangements. Um, put it this way, if it's not one level of government making it difficult, it's the other one. But I, I, on the funding arrangements, um, the, the issue also is, it's, it, I totally support, you know, the, the, it's um, quite dysfunctional because it varies so much across. But one of the challenges is price is often used as a lever for mm. volume and governments use pricing, and I'm going to use that term pricing, as a lever. And, and so we see f people flooding in directions because of a fee, I'm going to use the term a fee-free course because as a private provider, I'll be in serious trouble if I say that my courses are free. But um, let me just leave it there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but we're using pricing as, as a lever to direct people in certain directions. And so it is of significant consequence, as well as to the providers and how we access those, mm -hmm. those programs and how our clients do. But it's also a community issue because we are directing people based on fees. Mm -hmm. Chris, uh, you've said you just completed this diploma of sports development. Now you want to be a teacher, which is going to require a university mm -hmm. degree. Could I ask, what was, was that your original goal or was that something you decided on while you are doing your diploma? Um, uh, yeah, so I, 
previously uh, just completed my diploma, but prior to that I was looking to go um, study in the US for college, um, still with the teaching um, in mind, but um, didn't really have a thought of TAFE at all. TAFE was just sort of down here and um, the backup, well not, sorry, not a backup, um, university was the backup and TAFE was really just, just another, it wasn't even in the picture. Um, so I did have the teaching in mind. Um, the way I got to TAFE was my uh, best mate was signing up uh, to do business admin at Boxall Institute. And he goes, oh, do you want to come, you know, come for lunch and, um, you know, just sign up with me and, you know, just wait around, that sort of thing. So I said, yeah, I'll come, you know, wait till he does the testing. I was sitting around bored on my phone and I thought, might as well, you know, make, make my time useful. So um, I asked some questions about what sort of sport, uh, sport subjects, uh, sorry, sport diplomas they have and what they offer. And um, diploma of sport development was really what I wanted. So um, still in the mindset of teaching, um, I was told um, that some units will transfer, which didn't end up happening. But I look back at the big picture and the amount of uh, industry experience I got and what I learned um, at TAFE this year was, was huge. Um, recently being part of the World Conference, uh, the leadership camp, um, traveling to Canada for three weeks, um, part of a study abroad program. So yeah, it's, it's been great and still next year looking to do teaching. So yeah, that's, that's my answer. So ha have you used your vocational education in applying for teaching? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I've been uh, doing some uh, work down at my old high school, Doncaster. Um, and yeah, just been doing a lot of work there and still with the goal of teaching. So do, do you feel that the sector has been joined up from your perspective, that it's kind of, it's, it's going to be a relatively smooth transition from your diploma into a bachelor? Yeah, definitely. Um, I just think... I should I've, ask you this in 12 months maybe, but... Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've felt like I've learnt um, a lot of more, a lot more people, a lot um, higher people skills, um, with regards to you know being in it, being in the industry, whereas I felt like if I didn't go to TAFE this year, um, I just wouldn't know how to approach things. Um, stuff like LinkedIn has been a real, you know really big thing, and I had no idea before TAFE. Um, so yeah, I think I'm ready for next year, hopefully. Great. Now, Richard, you, you kind of alluded to some issues that you've had trying to run uh, vocational and higher education courses uh, together. Would you like to elaborate further on that? Because it presumably has, there are lessons there for other people in the room. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know, we um, ran what we call dual enrolment programs with uh, a range of the, uh, the regional TAFEs that we're co-located with. And um, the idea of that was that students were simultaneously enrolling in a university degree and a TAFE diploma and the two mapped across onto each other. Um, that meant that we were dealing with uh, federal funding for the higher education component, VET funding uh, for the vocational component. We had to reconcile um, two financial systems, the two institutions. Uh, we had to satisfy two funding bodies on how this worked. And um, just to bring Texer into the picture, we, fell, uh, we found ourselves confronted by the opt-in, opt-out ruling around nested programs. So the objective of these programs was to drive up the uh, proportion of students in, and they were in nursing, community services, and early childhood. And it was to drive up the number moving through to degree level qualifications, and it worked. We went from uh, about 5% transfers from TAFE nursing to uh, university nursing uh, under a standard articulation model to about 30% coming across. Now this is in towns that have chronic shortages of, of nurses at both levels. Um, uh, so it, it worked, we, um, but we found ourselves in a situation with nursing where because of the way it was structured, it was technically a, let me get this the right way around, an opt-out qualification, which meant that the TAFE was teaching at uh, AQF level five, but it was being judged as level eight. 
So we then found ourselves in a situation where for AQF plus one, the, um, the TAFE teachers all had to upskill, and those skills are not available in these communities. Now, it's an unforeseen consequence of the way those rules work, but you know, that's the kind of thing where we suddenly found ourselves dealing with this stuff. And it, it really is difficult for our compliance people to um, you know, relax, to, to, to be confident about doing something innovative, if you like, in this kind of, um, uh, in, this, in the current system that we have. So it's, it's difficult. We've had, to, um, we've had to pull the pin on that arrangement because of the changes to CSP funding and so on. And we're going back to uh, an articulation model that we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that the, uh, the benefits that allowed people to come across are still there. Mm. But at the moment, they're not, uh, they're not funded. But that experience of two governments, two regulatory agencies, throwing some professional regulators with their own views on um, who should be doing what um, makes for a massive amount of transaction costs. I'm sorry, that was a very long-winded yeah. explanation. But yeah, but do you have similar issues? Well, I, I would just um, echo. I think it's across public and private sector, these, these same issues, because we are working uh, in environments where we're a single tertiary sector, we're a post-secondary sector, we're supporting people, whether there are, there are you know, very few university degrees which aren't vocational in some nature. You know, they have a job or they have a career outcome as part of it. And the capacity to be able to join up those um, and the, the type of um, regulatory limitations. And sometimes, I think it's right, it's, it's the risk-averse nature um, of the institutions because we're so fearful. Everyone wants to do the right thing. We're focused on quality. We want to deliver. And so we have multiple masters. We have the customer, which might be the employer and the student or the industry association. And we have our, our regulators as well. So it, it is a very difficult um, area to navigate. And I guess communication is, you know, is one of the big things mm. there um, because often these things are new and emerging. They weren't contemplated when the legislation was first established. So as we move forward, I was at a skills summit yesterday. In fact, um, Professor Coldrake spoke at that skills summit in Queensland about the nature of the future. And you know, increasingly there are, there are future jobs that aren't going to require degrees, but they're high level but they're not at what we would consider to be at AQF, AQF level for a degree. And you know, so people are telling me, um, Kath, Dr. Catherine Ball talking about certificate four in cyber security is all you need to be working in that space. So it's, you know, it's a changing environment and um, the, the, the lack of joining up of those two regulators I think is you know, mm -hmm. part of it. A single regulatory environment for post-secondary would certainly be a mechanism to more seamlessly navigate it. Just to comment on that, Andrew, just to take it further, we, often in these forums we talk about the parity of esteem between higher education sector and the vocational education sector. That gets rebalanced really, really quickly when you have a student or someone from industry looking to get a certain uh, collection of skills mm -hmm. to secure either further advancement in their own workplace or another, another opportunity. So there's that sort of, you know, need that drives often the choices, but w I think the education sector sometimes gets a little bit too lost in some of the language around, around how it should be managed or administrated, and, and I think that's where we need to, I think, as, a, as, a, as an educational, tertiary education offer, really think more closely about how that's being presented to uh, those who are wanting to engage in the system so it is totally seamless. It's not just a mm. pathway, but a lot, a lot of our language is linear, uh, mm -hmm. A lot of our process is linear, but when you actually talk to the people working between institutions for the students who are interested, it works pretty well in the end. There's just a lot of back-end rubbish that um, could be tidied up a bit. I want to talk about how this is perceived by students. Uh, Chris, you, you seem to have some slightly unusual sort of overseas study ideas when you were at school, but yep. how are these options presented to you know, your classmates? You, know, yeah. you kind of suggested that TAFE was barely even mentioned, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't, a lot of the open days, um, we just had universities, um, and a lot of the talks we had um, during the senior years of high school was mainly just universities. So, um, of course, it's, it's a 
um, op it's a major option for a lot of students, but I felt like TAFE was sort of left out and looked, at, looked upon as a lower level. Um, whereas I had that feeling um, going into post-secondary uh, of, yeah, TAFE is sort of down here, but not with the realisation of the opportunities it's given me. So I feel like it does need to be recognised more. Now, after speaking to students at um, my uh, old high school and you know, talking to them about um, options and you know, saying that TAFE is an option, it doesn't have to be your, your last uh, option. So yeah, I feel like it should be recognised a little bit more. Did you observe any cost differences between TAFE and higher education? Because the, yeah. the fee market is very messy in vocational education. Did you? Yeah. Um, two answers to that. Um, firstly, with my course this year, I'd say um, it was fairly lower um, than my university course uh, will be next year. Uh, but then in saying that, I declined um, enrolling in next year's Cert 3 for fitness. Is, it was a two-week program um, asking for three to four grand upfront. So, yeah, f financially it was lower, but in saying that, some courses are higher. So, so, would you have done it if there hadn't been an upfront charge? Sorry? Would you have done that if there was a loan available? Uh, I would have reconsidered it. Yeah. I wouldn't have been, uh, whereas because it was a uh, sort of a hex fee uh, this year, didn't have to worry about it, whereas if it was up front, it would have um, been a lot different. Kathleen, is this a problem that there are you know, courses that receive no loans or receive inadequate loans in the vocational system? Is this something that affects students? It does. Um, as I said, there's, there's the multi-layered impact of funding in the vocational and training sector. So at the Certificate 3 or even at the Foundation Skills level or Enabling Skills, state government funding is available. But as was pointed out earlier, um, it's, it's often, not always in, uh, exclusively, but it's often a, um, a one-stop one opportunity when you've used your Certificate 3 guarantee funding, um, you've used it. And unless there is a particularly compelling proposition and, of course, decisions are made, industries change and uh, those arguments can be, can be put forward. Um, so that drives a lot of people to that, I'm going to say, that lower end, and, 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 and please, that's not a value judgment around those entry-level roles, whereas at the diploma level, the fact that only certain courses are approved for VET student loans now, there is the premium on those loans, which we will about, yeah. debate separately, yeah. yep. um, does, does have an impact. But interestingly, what we're finding increasingly is the, the willingness of um, people to engage in fee-for-service because they can, it, it can be a more flexible option for them. And so uh, I think one of the things that we'd be sitting in this room talking about funding, but the amount of training that is actually happening outside the Australian Qualifications Framework is extraordinary and growing, and people are paying for the privilege. So I think as providers, we have to understand what is driving people in that direction in terms of choice. Is funding part of it, for, and is, is choice and structure and uh, you know, the nature and the flexibility of those qualifications also a driver. So it's a very, very multifaceted um, answer. I'm sorry, but I think, I think they're all factors. Factors. Got plenty of questions. I'll ask, ask one more before we go to, the, to those questions, which is, should we do more to uh, alert people to the articulation into vocational education or one of these other qualifications than we do in higher education? That if you go to a lot of the upper level vocational qualifications, it'll clearly state what bachelor degree you can go to or what kind of bachelor degree. I don't think I've ever seen something equivalent uh, on a higher education course. Should we have that? Should we have it? I think it goes back to Chris's comment around the fact that vocational education and training branding at the moment probably wouldn't be perceived as being the next, the next step. I think it's a branding issue as much as anything. But the real opportunities are around identifying these as career, um, career readiness or career development skills, etc. And where possible, engaging with those through the university process to introduce it as a, um, a, a as was attempted mm. so admirably, um, as something which sits alongside with equal standard, equal footing, and equal value. Right. Mm. Yeah, it's a really that's a really interesting idea, actually. Um, Certainly, if, if I was working for a dual sector university, 
I will be going back um, to the office after this session and coming up with the idea of uh, want to enhance the, uh, the impact of your qualification, consider this vet skill, vet program you know, that, that will complement it. So not necessarily the kind of this leads to that, but this adds value to this. And I think that's where um, there's a game to be played. Um, and I shall do that very shortly. <laughs> Might go to audience questions. There's one for you, Chris. Uh, did you have the opportunity to share any learning experience with uni students? And if not, do you think this would be a valuable experience for university and TAFE students to study and learn together? Uh, yeah, so I haven't specifically gone to any universities or I've spoken to friends about my experience. Um, the question's gone. Um, what was the second part, sorry? I think whether we're going to be benefits in working together. Oh, benefits, yeah. yeah. I think it, it would be great um, to have the sort of experience in the industry and um, having opportunities to go out and um, work in your field while still um, learning in lectures. Um, so I think combining it would be great um, if that can work. So I know there is um, in some courses minimal or a level of industry in your exper uh, experience in your industry, but um, I think it would be great to uh, lift, lift that level. There's a question here about the the course content relationship between vocational and higher education, which is, you know, is there a partnership between TAFE or other providers and universities that ensures the university's course contents are in sync with the TAFE's course contents? To what extent does this go on? We're actually coordinating the course in some detail. Does it happen at all? Does, does, uh, that? It does for us, because we offer higher education yeah. as yeah. well as the vocational education as part of uh, our, our our educational programs and there's a high level of exchange um, looking at those pathways, looking at the, the needs of the students as they progress through the AQF and so for example culinary where you go from hands on the pans and the knives and things through to culinary management understanding uh, all of those broader management principles then there's a high level of integration and we make sure that there is the right mix as we do as best as we can. We're looking to continually improve of course about embedding an applied focus across all of those programs and um, a structure which drives a strong dialogue between the educational sim, both our, our higher educational area and our vocational education area is key to that success. Um, in, in our institution, um, and we're a vet provider, we're a higher education provider in our own right and we also act as a third party provider for a public university. Um, we do, in fact, engage our lecturers out of the university programs in the design and development of the VET um, program. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more of a one-way, but we want to optimise the learning opportunities. But we do um, certainly have that co-design model, uh, which, which just supports so that students aren't getting to that point where we hear sometimes, look, I've done this before and I'm having to repeat it. So the idea is that it, it is a more seamless um, and, and um, less repetition and wastage in the pathway. Mm. I've got a couple of questions uh, mentioning the voice of industry and the role of industry. Uh, is this an issue that there, is there a lack of consultation with the industry? I wouldn't have thought so, but is, or is higher education worse than vocational education on this? Do the panel have views on the, the role of industry? Uh, look, I mean, we're, we're currently working on um, uh, a couple of projects with uh, the TAFE sector where um, the, the first phase of that has been some, uh, some really deep engagement with industry. Now, um, I think in terms of, you know, establishing demand, establishing need, talking about content and so on, um, that's somewhere where it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, to, to advance the industry engagement. Um, I guess, you know, the, the, the challenge always is that in trying to implement what industry is asking for, you finish up again tripping all over, all over these um, regulatory and, and, and sector-specific um, issues. So, uh, I mean, I agree the voice of industry is missing, but frankly, if 
I invited our industry partners in to join in the kind of discussions we have to have. I would burn you know, all of the goodwill that we have with these people right from the start. Yeah. And I think there's, there's two issues in the vet space. I think the recent um, estimate is it takes about six years to get a training package from mm -hmm. beginning to fully developed and, and out into market. So the concept of being able to deliver it in the accredited space in, in, in the vet. Now that's a statistic which um, Minister Shannon Fentiman um, uh, shared with me, so I, I, can't, I can't state the source of that. But uh, the other is that if, as a private higher education provider, if you are not self-accrediting, the timeframes for a product to be taken to market is significant and the industry's requirements are usually immediate mm. or in fact, you know, yesterday. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to, other than if you are using existing product and, and, and working with that, to get anything new into market is a, is a very time consuming exercise. Is this one of the things driving the micro-credentials and other forms of alternative education? Well, I think, I, I would say yes. yes. And I think the other thing it's driving is the fact that people are moving outside the accredited space and they're, they're seeking um, industry qualifications. I mean, we've, we saw the rise of that over the last deca decade mm -hmm. in project management with, with standards and groups, and we saw it previously with Microsoft credentialing, et cetera. You know, industry developing in its own, its own um, standards as well. So I think it's a combination of industry, um, industry driving its own solutions, but equally, the, the capacity to be able to do, and, and I don't, I'm sure there's a Deakin representatives here in the room, I think some fa fabulous things that I see, I'm sure there's other universities doing, but uh, Deakin really taking what I call recognition of prior learning in the vet space and applying it into the higher education space, um, those sort of flexible options of recognising real life experience and uh, managing credentials around learned um, experiences. Got a question from someone who's doing a bachelor degree at a TAFE, uh, who says it tends to get looked down upon, even though it is a you know, recognised degree, the same way that all other bachelor degrees are recognised. Uh, how does the panel think this can be improved from being looked down upon and a last option to a normal academic choice? Chris, do you want to? Yeah. Um, from my personal experience, as I mentioned, I think just being more. Uh, recognise or uh, being more promoted at schools, um, as I as I pre previously mentioned, it w there was no one coming out from Box Hill, no one coming out from Holmes Glen, um, no one speaking to us and saying, "Hey, TAFE is an option." Um, it was more, you know, um, as the backdrop. So, yeah, it just needs to be more more spoken about uh, in schools and uh, publicly. This is overlapping with some earlier uh, sessions, but what hope is there that the AQF uh, review and the provider category reviews will help sort out some of these issues, particularly if they flow through to funding? Do you hold out hope? Um, I've been a cynic on the panel today. Um, look, I think the point you made earlier about um, the fact that the, the legislation and um, you know a lot of the guidance is it takes a long time to flow through to action is an important one. Um, I think if we can get the uh, you know through the various reviews that are going on, if we can almost kind of carve out a area where it's okay to innovate and it's okay to ask for advice as opposed to act and then um, if you like have to deal with the consequences retrospectively. Um, I think that would be a major step forward. It's almost, it, it's not quite a get out of jail card, but um, you know, again, the idea that you could actually have an agreement that this is a pilot, we will test it, we will see what happens, and then um, you know, if it works, we'll take that evidence and use it into a sort of more permanent part of the system. I would hope that would be an outcome from some of this. But just, what's interesting is the focus of the landscape of the debate. We're talking about 160, 170 providers. You'd, within the Texa frame, you drop to the ASQA frame and there's thousands. Mm. Uh, and, and for those that are sort of bridging within that, there's, you know, it would be wonderful to have a particular tertiary view and a particular tertiary vision which might help stitch up some of those 
differences between the way in which state jurisdictions interpret things and where the, where the Commonwealth come in over the top. I mean, maybe that's a hope beyond all hope, but I, I think that uh, we certainly should be having some discussion around that. I think the AQF is something that we all kind of get, and those improvements, I think, will assist, but it's the separation through regulation which I think is entrenching some of the challenges that are really the, the, the parts that all of the providers in the space are really dealing with. So I think we're headed towards uh, many reviews, which are going to look at this, which will think address the themes in this conference. We're also headed towards lunch. So I will thank the panel and hand back to Deb. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.